Good afternoon and welcome to another session, another oral history session as part of the Electronica Music Project that um, Electronic Music Malta and the M3P Foundation are uh, working on. Um, we've had three sessions uh, over the past few months and uh, the fourth session, which is uh, being held today as part of the Circuits Festival, is um, uh, actually a special one and for the fact that uh, we are actually going back in time rather than forward to uh, take a look at what was going on in the electronic music sphere locally. After obviously we had the, the um, influence of the foreign scene uh, coming through, through on radio and uh, eventually on TV as well, although that not so much at the time. And um, uh, so before we, we go into the actual um, uh, talk, interview, slash discussion. I'd like to say a couple of words about the actual project. So it's a collaborative project between EMM and the MP3P Foundation, launched last February with the aim of developing a historiography of electronic music in Malta. The project is supported by Arts Council and is part of the Spazio Creative program. The previous three sessions focused on the experiences and early roles of the DJ in Malta, the emergence of house techno and club culture on the local scene, the evolution of the DJ's role, role from music selector to bona fide producer, an artist, and in some instances, music collectives and bands. The radio presence and support and the aspect of promotion of both events and DJs and artist profiles. In this session, we'll sh we're shifting our focus to the 80s, the decade that brought synth pop and synthesizers to the masses, and how the genre impacted the Maltese music scene. And joining me for this session, I have um, a number of guests, as you can see, and starting from my uh, extreme left, Simon Psyla, who used to be a member of the band Art and Glass. Next to me, Pierre Caruana, who was part of the band Structure and other projects, as we will find out as well. Um, on my right, Charles Dalli from the band Extend, and I have also on the front row here, two more members, founding members actually, of, of the band Extend, Eric Calle and Godwin De Bono, and um, Edwin Balsam from Duo Blanc, who will be also um, forming part of this um, discussion. Uh, so be before we go into um, uh, maybe a whole discussion about the scene per se, a brief uh, introduction individual introduction about what the, what you feel was the determining factor uh, for you to get involved in electronic music or to be a to become a fan of electronic music I'll start with Simon um, it can be the fact because uh, we used to like uh, like electronic bands and we wanted to create something locally of course it was difficult but um, we managed to do something, I think. So let, let me get this right. Uh, when you were influenced by uh, foreign bands, I think at the time it was mostly British yes, bands British. that were incoming and, and to, uh, to via the radio in Malta. Were you actually a musician at the time? Not really, no. Not really. No. So uh, obviously you had that biggest hurdle was to actually first get into music and then yes. you had to kind of compact it uh -huh. into a short time because you wanted to learn the instrument and start playing of as course. well. And every instrument is different though. Obviously. And so uh, you started to learn how to play the synth because you wanted to be in the band. Yeah. That was the, the driving. First I used to learn piano as well. But it, 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 had, it takes five years to get the, you know. and To do it properly. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to stop and just play by, by ear. By ear, yes. Okay, and uh, that seemed to do, still do the trick for you because you yeah, still managed to, yeah, to, to yeah. compose yeah. along with the rest of the band. Perhaps um, a quick word about the band Art and Glass, mm -hmm. a brief history, so to speak. Uh, we were five, there were four of us. We used to like the same kind of music, the same genre, electronic, the same bands eventually, and uh, we started saving to get the instruments. You know, we got the instruments and we needed a singer then. We started auditions and we got uh, a singer as well. And we were a five piece band. But you weren't totally synth, oh, oh, it wasn't only synth, you eventually At first, had yes, also a guitar. But we had a guitar as well, just a little bit. Okay, just, <laughs> just to have a guitar yeah. sound in the mix. Just to complete well. the sound. Okay, and um, uh, as a band, maybe um, uh, 
a bit of a, an insight on your part on getting started as a band. I mean, where, where was the, where were you rehearsing or getting together? Mm -hmm. We used to rehearse in Valletta as well. We had a house there. Um, with neighbors knocking at the door, turn, turn down the volume, but we managed. So soundproofing wasn't? No, uh, it, wasn't the okay. it wasn't the thing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, I'll move to Pierre as well. Same question, what was it that got you into electronic music? Um, I think you started before electronic music, you were already involved in music, no? Well, when I was young, I played and I was learning a little bit of guitar. Um, but I, I don't think it was my... Uh, I did compose a few songs on guitar until I was 16. Um, then I actually stopped playing guitar at all. And from 16 till basically till 21, 22 years, I stopped music altogether. I was but listening to what was happening in the music scene. Um, honestly, I still favored symphonic rock. That is my... Um, Your niche. Yes. Genesis, Barclay James Harvest and Gen Vangelis and all the likes. Um, just a year before I decided to uh, get into involved in a band, I actually was walking near the old parliament. There was a Casio shop and I saw this Casio tone <laughs> and I tried it and uh, I immediately... Um, so you had an idea on... No, 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 not at Nothing. all. Oh, just I just... You know, I just loved, just you know, I just, yes. Okay. Well, when I was young, even at five years old, I used to go to my aunt. Uh, she had a piano and I used to play, you know, Christmas carols and whatever. And so I always had that ear to play um, the piano. Okay. So I've always liked the piano, but this Casio tone um, did the trick because it had also beats. It, has a, it, beats, it, yes. it, it had beat, a beat box. So I, could play and accompany myself. And that was what started it all. I started with playing two notes, actually one note bass here and two notes here. And then I, I improved into two notes and started. Doing so you self-taught? Yes, as well. self-taught myself. Yes. Okay, same as uh, yes, Simon. And yes. your first band yes. was? Structure. It was Structure, all right, so. I was the nucleus of Structure, me, uh, the bassist Mike Harrison, who was with Shock Tonics before, before yeah. and also the drummer Joe Dusty, who Varuja, who was with Shock Tonics as well. well. Right. So we were the, the three founding members of Structure. And obviously at that time, me and Michael were still trying to pull the band into the rock scene rather than into the new wave scene because. Mike liked King Crimson, yes. <laughs> and yes, and all, you know, bands like that. And, but Joey, who was appreciably uh, older than us, was listening to new bands like Simple <laughs> Minds. We hadn't even known about them at yet. He, he introduced us to this type of music. And so, together, and also with the entry of Mike Bukowski, who was with Chai too. His melodies in, 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 in his, and his style was more new wave as well. Yes, um, so we had this cocktail of uh, individual, uh, each individual ideas uh, were put together, and that cocktail made the first sounds of structure, of which structure. were not entirely electronic, but we were going into that direction already. Eventually, there was the addition Eventually of another also, synth player. Yes, and uh, also he and came, yes, in fact, he came. George. George came, he used to play with Chuck Tonics, the trumpet. Obviously, he tried to come back with the trumpet and uh, the drummer told him there is no space for a trumpet was very in this space, sort of uh, <laughs> arena now. The music scene was changing and then sort of the new romantic style and all that uh, was changing. The music change, music yes, was changing quickly, um, and so uh, he came with a synth. He was actually the synth player more than me because I was doing the backing, backing, yeah, carpets and you know organs and things like that. Whilst he was doing the melodies with uh, with synths, and right. that uh, 
cocktail together gave us the first um, sound, which was not entirely electronic, but had, but had an, an electronic component to qu it. Quite a strong electronic yes. component as well. And yes. then obviously you had the vocalist, uh, Tony Sant, who <coughs> kind of gelled, I think, with yes. all of you and producing the music yes. that structure eventually um, uh, produced as well. So let me move to you, Charles. Um, I know we've spoken in the past, but for the benefit of our um, uh, audience tonight, um, perhaps a word about uh, Extend, the formation of Extend as well, with, with, together with Eric and uh, Godwin. Yeah. Uh, rightfully, at the beginning of this session, you said that um, you have to go, we are going back in time. But I believe, strongly believe, that sometimes you have to go back in time to visit the future. That's one of my principles. And uh, my inspirations were Peter's Rolling Stones. I'm a 60s child, so actually from 1959. But 60s were my whole youth, you know? And I, I grew up with the melodies of the Bee Gees, uh, Beach Boys, Rolling Stones, and Beatles. So when we came to the 80s, um, with the kind of melodies they were producing, especially in the UK, um, with the kind of instrumentations they were giving the new songs, the new sounds, uh, it was something fantastic. The, the, the same kind of melodies that they were producing in the 60s, mixed with the kind of music, uh, with, the, with, with, with the kind of music they were producing in the 80s, the kind of synthesizer uh, they were playing, it was fantastic. So uh, for me, uh, the 80s will be uh, the special time. Uh, that's where special space and time that uh, nothing compares to the 80s. Now, I was lucky enough to meet these guys, Godwin and Derek, and with them, Chris Kassar and Sandra, the formation of our first lineup of the band Extend. Uh, I had a relatively small studio in Valletta, and someone brought these guys to me to make the first recordings. And uh, I was lucky enough that they had no singer. And I was experimenting with, the, with some synthesizers and this kind of things. And they came up with synthesizers and the, the same kind of music I was sort of into. We were listening to the Pesh Mode, mostly. Uh, and some other bands of the, at the time, but mostly Depeche Mode. And uh, they were synth orientated, 100%. So we clicked immediately. Um, Eric, on his own merit, is a very good guitar player. So we mixed the guitar with the synths, and we had the sort of new sound for, the, for, 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 for us. And uh, we clicked, we rehearsed, and we, we, we uh, went playing our first concert, and then our second, and um, we're having fun. That's the most important thing. When you're playing music, the most important thing is you have fun. Because I believe that when you have fun, the music comes out naturally and comes out good. When you're having fun, it transmits to the people in front of you. When you're having fun, you are going to do lots of beautiful music. And um, I'm sure that Eric and Godwin can actually add a bit to this as well, because since you were the, the founding members, let's say, before Charles stepped in as well as your uh, vocalist actually, and part of yes, the band. Yes, uh, Charles was perfectly right. Um, it was Godwin who started it all. Uh, later, he will have the opportunity to say some Surprises as well, probably, because <laughs> <laughs> he has something to say, which we never, it never came out. Um, yes, uh, what happened we, was that me, Godwin, and Chris and Sandra, we were rehearsing, and we were producing very nice sounds, turning them into like a song, but we needed like someone who could... Some guidance. Perhaps. Yes, exactly. And we found ourselves in Charles' studio, <laughs> Uh, actually, it's true, we didn't have a singer. I was trying to find someone, but actually, <laughs> I just, 
I can be this singer, you know, because <laughs> I'm a singer. But he had, he he was had a, an advantage he was of a, having yes, inside and he, he had songs, already so. a solo experience and he had another band before, like I did. Um, so, and it's true, we, we just clicked and the adventure started from there. A very big adventure, up till now. I don't know if they tricked me into recording them for free, yeah? I still don't know. <laughs> Probably yes. <laughs> well, it lasted, I think so. It lasted, yes. so. Um, when I was a kid, I always liked uh, myself experimenting with sounds. So um, I couldn't afford a keyboard. So I tried to build one, to be honest. And I've done it. In time, yes, I took about six months to, to do it, but... Um, that's not so bad. I've That's done it fine. with someone else, but not only me. It, I had a friend of mine who helped me a, 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 a little bit, but um, it happened anyway. Uh, in the meantime, I, I knew Chris Kasser. He was uh, from my school where, where I used to go. And he told me, listen, do you uh, know where, where, where we can do some rehearsals? And at that time, I had a place of my, of my aunt that she wasn't using it. So I said, yes, I talked to her and, uh, and we'll see. So that's what happened, and we were in Baluta. You remember? That's um, how we actually had the base, at yes, least, to start yes, from. Yes, to start it. So we started in, in that place. Um, in the meantime, Chris uh, was, um, uh, he was using an, an analog um, drums, but in time, um, he was saving money to, to get the Sims. Uh, I think Sims it was, right? Simmons. Sims. Um, Simmons, yes, right. Simmons. Uh, and actually, he bought, he, he bought them, right? And... Uh, uh, then we bought a keyboard for, 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 Sandra. for Sandra, yes, and we bought it in installments, to, um, I remember I think clearly. I, w I, will be, I will be going a bit into that as well, because that was uh, quite a feat in itself to actually yes, acquire uh, a synthesizer so, in yes. those days, yes. And in fact, we, we had the, the keyboard that I um, built, built up myself, and the keyboard um, she had, um, Sandra. And we were doing some, mine was more for doing some sound effects than uh, being realistic a keyboard keyboard, just to, uh, to be honest. But it made some sounds that it was nice at the 80s, you know? Um, afterwards, when we met um, uh, Charles, he had more uh, keyboards, and, and in that time, um, I was lucky um, to know a guy from America that he brought me a keyboard from there. It's called Mirage and, and Sonic. You remember that one, Charles? Uh, right? Yeah, one of the first synthesizers. Uh, and it was a sampler. Sampler, sampler. It was a sampler. Sampler synthesizers. And, and, it, and this one, he bought the, uh, the, what, so with the, the, the Roland yeah, Saturday 09. And we started doing those, so those nice, nice <laughs> melodies <laughs> with those kind of, of keyboards. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how actually um, you started. Um, the one that I built, yes. <laughs> still there. Still there. Still there. <laughs> that will be interesting, I think, for another. Uh, Addition of circuits. Um, <laughs> I've hopefully still there, to be honest, because I left it in the garage, so I hope it's still there. You hope it's still, still there. there. In a one piece. Although, no, I mean, you know, some crawling things that can eat yeah. it, eat, 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 eating it out, you know, what I meant. <laughs> so. Right, so um, um, going back to the, the acquisition of synths, actually, now that uh, Simon mentioned, obviously we've all, we, we all know and anybody in the audience who is a musician and started um, perhaps uh, playing back in the day knows that it, it wasn't as easy to actually acquire a synth because there were still early days for the importation of, of the instrument. They were very expensive as well. And um, the Japan issue. Huh? From, from and the years, Japan the issue, Japan yes, issue. the Japan issue as well. The, uh, commerce, the commerce between Malta and Japan, Japan and Malta. Really and that is, that the that best synthesizers were from Japan, obviously, but, Yamaha, Korg. But today that uh, was an opportunity because today Malta is full of very rare Italian synths. Some of them, um, only a couple were, were uh, made. The Gen. Like the Sings 508, yeah, yeah. for example. It's rumored that only, for example, 60 were made. So Nani had to import them because there was a shortage of polyphonic synths. <laughs> and these were like produced before the company went bust. So Malta has like a, tro a treasure trove of uh, CL, uh, Key Tech, you know, which w apart from Italy or Greece, oh, we are quite uh, well yeah. equipped with. He has one. <laughs> Key Tech? Yes, yes. Krumer, the Krumer from Nani I have. Yes, literally, the, the old were all built yeah. from the same region in Italy, in Marca and the Atlantic. It was Italian Krumer. Exactly, exactly. So that's, that's another aspect of, of uh, well, if you own one of these, hang on to it. You just and increase the price on eBay, Edwin. <laughs> 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 
I do get a lot of offers, especially on the things 508. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, oh. <laughs> Perhaps, you never know. Stradivarius. If you the, find the, a collector who's that crazy. The yeah. string machine, no. The Echo Stradivarius, oh no. Because <laughs> actually, actually there is a... Um, there is a thing. An Echo Stradivarius, which is a string machine, which... Uh, which uh, <laughs> yes, right. But no, so, no, no, no. Some of them, yes. Go Some figure. of them, yes. Go actually, figure. the rarest Italian, like the ones, the Sultans, and like the ones that were DFBT, that were very rare. Some of them are cost... cost of toes. And, and since you're in the conversation as well, Edwin, it worth perhaps something that applies to all of, of the uh, guests here as well. When it came to actually buying uh, the synth, apart from the price tag obviously being the determining factor, um, were you aware of what you needed to buy? Was there um, accessibility to information about what you really want to be looking for? It was a combination by two things. It was a combination by two things. Huh? It's uh, first of all the price, the, the price. and the second uh, it has to um, reach your what you what you want it for, mm -hmm. you know. So, but what, have, was that information readily available? No, you have to, uh, to spend time in the shop. Yes, in the shop, yes. <laughs> or you have to go to uh, try it at that the time, shop. There was no then... internet in our side. Yes, no, of course. So That's why I'm asking. No, no, no. You, um, it's either uh, uh, from magazines or or you have to buy it from the shop. Oh. Check it on the, from the shop, mm -hmm. or else um, you're in trouble. And if you start because weekend, you buy something that, that you don't that have That was one of the, the, the biggest VI, problems, huh? really, huh? because it's not like the internet today. You can yes, yes, of course. See a YouTube Find information. Uh, demo no, you can't about the no. synth. Yes, so yes. You had to, you rely had to actually go and try it. Either the few agents that there were getting it here, or else you blindly buy it and whatever. And make the best come. out of it. And there wasn't much. So although I, I was actually the guitarist. I was very interested in, in synths and other stuff, electronic stuff, and uh, I wanted to, 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 to try. I, I, this, it was the only thing you could do. I mean, just try to hear if it was uh, good enough for what you were trying to do. Uh, at the time, I was, I was kind of obsessed with uh, this Japanese band called Yellow Magic Orchestra, and their sounds were really fantastic. They were actually a bit different from the European sounds, um, but they were beautiful, you know, they, they were very close to Giorgio Moroder's sound. So um, I wanted to find a synth that had similar this sound, and, and that one, the, the Saturn, had a couple of sounds which they, they were quite like those, the sounds I was looking for. So, so that's why you went so I said, for that I, I'm going to get this, I don't care, I'm going to have this one. <laughs> Even if you were not playing? Exactly, yes, 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 yes. Right. But with the band I was playing guitar, <laughs> but at home I was experimenting on my own, and the song, the songwriting I was doing, I was doing it on, on, the, on the synth, on the keyboard, right, so not, on, not on guitar. It still contributed to, to the composition yes, yes. Um, uh, stage exactly. along with the band, so exactly. obviously. Yes. But I, I think that uh, to go into the right vibe of the early 80s, you must um, go into the psychology of the whole thing, of the whole early synthesizer thing. You know, um, the, 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 the 70s were dominated with heavy guitars and guitars and rock and punk and everything. Not that I have something against it, eh? I like it. But um, uh, the, the music scene was dominated with guitars and, guitar and more guitars and heavy guitars and heavy metal and everything. And uh, this, this synth didn't exist. Maybe for the German band, what's Kraftwerk. called? Kraftwerk. in the, the, the late 70s, they were producing some electronic music. But apart from that, we had nothing. The early 80s, we had ska, we had uh, a, a little bit of punk rock and then um, but then, and the first bands the, of synth pop the, as the, well. The, yes, but then the synthesizer began to emerge. So, uh, because if someone walks into that door right now, what's this fuzz about the synthesizer? The fuzz about the synthesizer must we must explain that it didn't exist. Imagine a world without synthesizers. Then, and you hear only guitars, bass guitars, drums, and, and the, whole, keys. the whole lot, the whole lot, or pianos, no. or the whole lot. But then, at once, you you begin to hear that kind of sound the synthesizer makes, it's something fresh. Uh, it, it comes out of all that guitar stuff. I say it again, I have yeah, nothing yeah. Ab uh, wrong about guitars, eh? or something against sure, guitars, sure. okay? But um, it comes out of that guitar world 
and all of a sudden you hear that synthesizer sound. Because that explains why we're making such a fuss about the LS synthesizers. It was completely different. It was fresh. It was something new. Uh, it was something uh, you don't, uh, you didn't hear in records. Uh, 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 then from that, from that moment you begin to hear synthesizers, that kind of synthesizers, those synthesizers. What's this sound? What's this sound? It's something new, it's something fresh. And the music, all the music, uh, got a boost from the synthesizer. Oh, because even, even the rock world, because uh, once, uh, once something is dominated by something, it gets boring. Uh, how many hours you, you get to hear guitars and more guitars and more guitars and more? Even if you like them, uh, you, you must take a break. Then when something different comes, you have a balance. And you have a balance, you have more fun. And uh, more, qu more quality, apart from quantity. And the music gets nicer and gets more interesting because you can experiment with some things. Even great That's bands true. like um, Pink Floyd, they're very guitar orientated. Okay, a little bit different, but guitar orientated. But they began to experiment with the synthesizers that were available at that time. And their sound took a turn. Yes, definitely. Uh, and the music, all of the music got better. I think, in fact, uh, it was Not something you I think wanted to. The synthesizer no, no. is king. <laughs> <laughs> I, thi I think further to what you're saying, actually, uh, but I was going to ask this to the other other. In fact, I well. would like to ask I tell something exactly on what um, um, Charles is saying. Um, there is uh, that that. Um, Thank you, Edwin. You say something. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Um, there was that interview with Gary Newman, who, with Tube Way Army, was completely focused on punk mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. non-electronic sound. Yeah. Uh, up till the moment when there was the studio, where there was a Minimoog in the middle of the studio, and possibly a. Obviously, he, he's famous more for the polymog and the Vox Humana sound and all his sort of one-handed, uh, one-fingered melodies. But he had this, that this sound that as soon as he played, all the like sound system of the studio was going to explode. It was like a powerful um, moog sweeping sound. And he said, "Imagine if this was just a beep, it's just an effect." I mean, it it changed his. His, his, but one question I wanted to ask you guys is, and I hope I'm not jumping up at the gun, is... I, I think it might be the it's, same it's question. Is this sequence ahead. we're going to ask no, about? No, no, okay. yeah. So there, obviously in Malta, when the keyboard started entering and you guys started playing electronic music, there was always a bit of, a, you know, like um, the wave of the rock against the wave of the electronic music. But, and, and, and also we discussed this even with Tony, Tony Santa about the aspect that, strictly speaking, if you're playing electronic drums, it has to be a drum kit and you have to play it live. But you guys were the first guys that possibly used sequencers for the first time. Um, how was it when you were playing with sequencers? Was it any uh, like talking that you were like playback? I mean, and, when uh, you're having fun, don't you don't know. put uh, rules just, just to your fun. Uh, we, no? we had a lot of uh, other t um, musicians saying that we we, never, we, we don't know how to play or whatever. We ignore them, to be honest. Um, we just want... It, it may be worth explaining a bit. The problem was um, uh, sometimes was logistically, it wasn't worth setting up a live setting, uh, uh, um, set up, yes. when you could go and play a few songs and have it with, with a band. Yes, but you know. even when we play live, we used to use sequencers. Mm -hmm. So you have tracks there ready for you, yeah. which is more harder than playing live. Because you cannot um, sleep with, with it, you have to go yeah, exactly, you or else alert. you're in trouble, you know? So, um, there's a, at that time, at the 80s, um, the worst thing that I think it was there at that time, at least in Monta, I don't know, abroad, the PAs, they weren't so, so, so good, you know? So, um, you have to be careful what you, uh, how you're going to play, or else you're going to have a lot of feedbacks, a lot of things that you don't want them, you know, and we had that problem, you know. Even the PA, they weren't that big enough, like today's, it's, it's a different story, you know. Yes, I, I mean, um, they, were, they weren't, they were still adjusting, I think, to the, uh, I mean, the, the arrival of synthesizers, to be fair, in the, in the music uh, was very new. And it was a bit of a shock to the system, to, to a lot of people, until they actually adjusted and see how this new 
two. instrument, or at least instruments, um, can be reined in and used to build and enhance what the work that they're doing musically. And I, that was a question I was going to ask, in fact, uh, to what you were um, saying before. Is, uh, you, you explained quite well that for you it was a fresh sound and it was exciting because it gave you new options. But um, I'll, I'll switch to Simon and, and Pierre. Um, how did it affect you guys? All right, in the case of Simon, it was the starting point. The synth was the starting point, so you didn't have to adjust to it. But uh, Pierre, you were playing guitar before, and then you got your hands on a synth. But uh, yeah. that the Casio tone was perhaps a bit more basic at the time. Yes. But eventually you got, you know, yes. better audience that gave that you eventually. more opportunities. But, but having, all started with Casio all, right? all started. having said that, did you that, all start with the Casio tone as well? Like having said guess. that, that was the you audition. <laughs> that was the synth I used as an audition with the with the, the other two members, and I was uh, for structure. Yeah, for right. structure, because I didn't have any other. I mean, that was it. Then I bought from Nani um, a symphonic ensemble, which basically played either organ or strings. And uh, that's why I was mainly the, the guy who played the carpets and the fillers. Whilst George got the other type of synthesizer, which was the the, all, all, all the knobs and whatever. Yeah. And, uh, he played all the leads and uh, sound effects and whatever. So we had different roles, uh, roles within the same band. And uh, obviously we still had to give um, enough space for the guitar. So we had a balance. We were not a fully electronic band, but then we went into the recording studios in uh, 1984 and we recorded our first two singles which we asked our, our producer, um, Paula Bella, at that time, Maestro Paula Bella. I think um, you all shared the same producer, no? Uh, Paula Bella was like the, the first the album. You, you did, and first no. album. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the first yeah, album was with Paula Bella as well. Yes, I but it's, it's more that we were, we were telling advised, what, what advice. we wanted. Yes, yes, <laughs> well, still working, kind of but working sounds, with. But Paula Bella was the go-to person because he was one of the first people to actually yeah, work, work at Smash Studios yes, on, on synths and, and the yes, rest, I think. So. And obviously, um, uh, Paul Abela, we asked him to give us, to, to help us produce two songs which would have um, airplay, uh, radio airplay advantage. Obviously, with the kind of music we were playing, as we were playing them, they were a little bit more into the rockish style. We wanted to move on and make them a little bit more, more electronic pop. and more pop, so that it was like pop rock more than anything at the beginning. That's how Structure started. Then obviously when the lineup of Structure dismantled and we so changed there were different formations in the second formation of Structure, when Michael Harrison was replaced by Joe Fennec, in 1985, that was a game changer. That was when Structure became an electronic band, really, because the kind of uh, slapping bass that uh, Joe Fennec came with, it's totally different from the kind of bass that uh, Michael, Michael was more um, old school, because he loved symphonic rock, like me. But Joe Fennec and Joe, the drummer, Joe Dusty, both of them together, they were the nucleus of the change from the sort of slightly electronic into a proper, more electronic band. And I remember also, Joe had got the Simmons kit yes, as well. Yes, as well. And he also had, I don't know what it's called, but the one that had... Uh -huh. The pads, the pads. One, one pad that, uh -huh. ding, that was before the Simmons. That was, you know, um, was quite expensive at that time and only someone like Joe, Joe, Joe yeah. who had a business, <laughs> could afford buying it because that was another problem. The first synth that I bought from Nani cost about 550 Maltese pounds, which in today's terms is 1,500 euros compared to, the, compared to today, that would cost like as if it cost 5,000 euros. You could buy four cents with that money. <laughs> no, it was quite expensive. 
and they did only just one, two sounds. We were very limited. There was no, there were, there were no keyboards from the local scene that you could buy with sequence. We could only hear, I, I loved Vangelis and I loved Giorgio Moroder, but we didn't have access to those type of synthesizers. Uh, synthesizers. They were too expensive for us. Uh, and I loved Gary Newman and I loved uh, electronic bands and other new wave bands like Flock of Seagulls and uh, Tears for Fears, you know, but we couldn't emulate those because we're, but when into, in 1985, I bought the Poly 800, the Cork Poly 800 from Dominic Gallia. They were fresh, they had just come in. It was a small synth that you could also strap, uh, strap on yourself. And uh, I had also to assume the role of frontman because Michael Bukowski left, George Falson left, and we ended up with a four member band where I had to play sort of the major roles. I mean, there was only just bass, drums, and me as, uh, as music. And also we sometimes employed someone to help us in a little bit of guitar work. But we did um, some gigs, just the four of us as well. Um, I know that, uh, Simon, um, you had um, a variety of synths with, with art and glass. I think there was, you mentioned earlier, I the Kruma. But I had just two. I had, I, from Tom Nicali, I got the Roland, the Juno 106, and then I got the Bit 99 from Nani. And it well. was difficult. I, I preferred the Roland, though. I still do. To the this sound. Do you still uh, have it? Yeah. The uh, Juno 106? No, the 106. No, I bought one of those. It had an issue, and I had to. Yes, oh, I had oh. an issue with uh -huh. it as well. One of in every yeah. eight, eight notes. Silent the, note. Uh, uh, for silent note. Right, and so I had to, change, had to sell it. But I loved it because. It was very, very much the sound. Uh, so this problem was very fixed. fixed. It was very 80 sound. The, the yeah. they, never, they never fixed this problem of the silent note. Ashen, but they no. stopped the production. Oh, that's All right. Good. So they went on to another model uh, instead. I, I, know, I think there is still the problem was um, the silent note from the processor. Huh? They couldn't fix it, so, so they had to change the probably just the processor. The whole it, thing it would be more expensive to. Um, to buy a new one instead of uh, fixing it at that time. But they still do it, no? Did you know 106? You yes, can yes, still yes. find some in there, no? But I it's a problem from the processor, no? Because... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but they revamped it. They, they've made, I think, uh, sort of... But they still... It still remained as Yeah, but at that time, so it was too expensive to, to try and fix it. Of course. Because at that time uh, the thing is... Like that. To, 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 if we need a part from abroad, you couldn't do it from here. So you had to wait to fix it. Yes. Well, it was very difficult. That was part of the problem of the thing being still uh, emerging. Uh, you on could the local only scene. fix something at Nani's if you buy it from Nani. You can't uh, go with something that you bought from someone else and you go. Yes, of you course. Know. That was always a problem, that's a as, problem well. as well. There, there was the music very shop very in, in. Music uh, shop as well, yes. Sacred Street? Uh, yes, I, I remember the music both, shop. Both the it, it, they the had sequential circuits. I went in and asked for the price, it told me 750. So you walked out again. Tears <laughs> uh, uh, came to my eyes. Well, I, cannot, yeah, I liked it, but I couldn't buy it. For, for it. the Canzone yes, yes. uh, Maltia, when we played Windsurf, I bought the sequential circuit with Prophet 2000. And it was, I had bought the full, just 1,800 Maltese pounds, the full version, the full everything. It was, but it was a very expensive keyboard, which I had to pay installments and uh, it almost ruined me financially, <laughs> but I had to do it because we we had to we had to play at a prestigious festival, and because this song Windsurfer had sequencers in it, we had we ha I had to. There was no other way. I mean, you either do it or forget yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Um, regarding, since I know that there was another uh, uh, Roland in the Art and Glass formation as well, wasn't there, Maria? Maria used to have a. Uh, uh, JX3P. Yeah, so so you know, quite, JX3P. your sound was quite heavy on, on, on scenes. Yes, too. That was I was doing bass and she was, and the effects, and she was doing the mm. melodies. Whereas if, if I switch, for example, to, like you said, uh, with structure, it was more, it was It was more balanced but, at mm. first, but then but it eventually. went more uh, into, into the electronics. I know with, with X10, for example, it was uh, the first, I think, uh, not only the first album, but also uh, the second was quite uh, uh, heavy on, and until bits from the scrapyard as well, I suppose. 
actually all of them uh, until 1997 we've, we've changed the there were always the sound, uh, no? there was always a, a strong presence of synthesizers yes. yes only in uh, um, oh the christmas power play power play and the power, power play, play the was, was album and the christmas album if then is something uh, different right, but for this but then eventually, all right, eventually in yes. later years then you started yes. to go to a more, perhaps more organic sound as well but you still use yes, synthesizers anyway. no yes it, we're still but now we're doing some combinations mm -hmm. yes. of course and in the beginning, when you were starting to write songs and before you actually went into the studio then to, to uh, work on the material for the album, because um, when, when you had one passaport of Sanremo, San yes. um, uh, that gave you the opportunity to actually release the single, or was that the album part of the deal as well? Um. I don't remember exactly that. It's better. The single, it? the single, single was the single, yes. but, but only the single. So yeah, obviously single. that was the stepping the album, stone you needed. The, uh, yes. uh, the album was the album, not the album. The album was after, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. So, but that, but that was an important stepping stone for you to, yes. to actually say, okay, yes. now we're here, we're, we've got this far, yes. and we've got the songs, so we have to. Pushed everything. Yes. Yeah. You know, the single, the album, the future of the band, everything. I mean, I'm, I'm mentioning this for the simple fact that I think back in the 80s, although Art in Glass came a, a bit after uh, Extend, I believe, and the uh, structure were there before, but it was releases. We, we were formed in 1984. Exactly, and I think the same time out. that you. The first concert was in 1984, 84 and one was of the first concerts, actually, we played with Extend uh, at Hamru, Boy Scouts. Uh, when me and Tony got to blows. Oh, no, but, but Tony, yes, but... Then we became friends. You see, Tony, Tony, as you, obviously everybody knows him, um, Tony was the kind of, he was 16 years old, and he liked music, which was even further back than any yes, of us. true. The Doors and, you know, all that kind not, of... Uh, not of me, because I'm, like yes, I told yes. you before, I'm from the 60s. Yeah, but from, so, yeah, from, from us, from us, yeah, from, from, the the band. Whole, uh, from the from, band. From the right. members of the <laughs> band. He was actually <laughs> further back from everybody else. So he loathed electronic music. He didn't like it. And he was very, very, he was one of he the was people. He was resistant to it. He was resistant. And when we tried at, uh, uh, to move into the more electronic field, I think it was actually why Michael Harrison and, uh, and uh, Tony left the band and they formed artwork. artwork. Which eventually sort of still had an still electronic had feel to it. <laughs> <laughs> but, anyway. but, but I think it might have been one of the uh, things because yes. we were moving in the, the trigger. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right, in fact you mentioned uh, that you've played th that gig together and I wanted to ask perhaps if there were particular events that you played at especially back in the day, that uh, still remain in your mind for hopefully a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gig was, was never not one of them, no. <laughs> because I was expecting that we were going to get beaten and my synthesizer being destroyed to bits after getting, getting down from that. I'm not a violent person. No, no. <laughs> but it wasn't our fault. It was just no, no. Uh, Tony Sun oh, yeah. being, what, what, what yeah. being Tony Sun. Actually, the day after, because Mike Harrison, he lived in my street. Good. Cameron Street in Zero. We, yes. we met, uh, hey, oh, yeah. well, uh, then let's, have a, then right, let's have a beer. Let's have a beer. Then we great friends, actually. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, from that moment, yes. Tony Sun was only 16 I've actually years old. heard the story uh, from Tony yeah, himself. You yeah. have to understand his we age. We became best of friends, yeah, actually, yeah. and I have respect but, for him but today, there, like I had. Were, were there other, uh, I mean, I imagine the Passaporto Person was uh, Yes, there was, the, there was the Euro Rock concert in Frankfurt. Uh, where um, us extend and artwork as well. Artwork, yeah, but we, the, the main man for artwork was uh, Paul, uh, Paul Borch. So we were involved. No, that they were before Paul Borch. There was joined. this. In, in there Germany, was Mark it was, it was uh, Paul Borch in Germany. Oh, but that was when they played in Germany uh, with uh, you guys. Uh, so uh, what happened uh, was there was this ra radio station in Germany and uh, they wanted to make a three day concert. Three day concert, I think. Uh, sort of festival. Uh, a festival. Festival. And then they wanted to gather uh, like a band from each country in Europe. And they gathered uh, quite a few and then they put them into categories, different categories. And we ended up playing with Wet, Wet, Wet. And uh, we, uh, we, no, there were three bands us, Wet, 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 and Glory. There was no support band. We were just all guests there. 
the same. We were the, the opening act, and after us there was Gloria, and then there was Wet, Wet, Wet. And that is when, uh, how, do, how do I explain this? So we were talking about sequencers. That is when I said, oh, that is a real sequencer. When Wet, Wet, Wet played their sequencers, you know, how, how can you, you hear a whole orchestra with a four-piece band? You know, and then we realized that that's what's going on, you know. So, so, came back so, the it, so, so this... <laughs> they had a 16 track. This had to happen. And they were doubling on the track. So, yeah, so, of so okay. when we came back, we said, next concert, this has to happen. And we did it like the other bands that were in vogue. The, the big bands I'm talking mm -hmm. about, the European, British... That, that is still bands. now happening. Yeah, I mean, but but the, the, at that time, it was... Yes, it was new. At that time, the, the, the word is mind-blowing. Of course. Mind blowing. You hear, oh my, how, oh, you know? Yeah. So we acted, we acted the same way. The sound That's quality, uh, the sound That's quality they, they you produced. Can, you, you can never emulate the sound quality when you have backing tracks. Uh, 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 when you hear them, it's like it you're hearing, the, kind of, you're hearing the, the studio kind of, version. It depends uh, on the but, don't, don't forget the patch mode, just, they had the reel behind them, so. Uh, uh, it depends <laughs> on the kind of music you, you are get playing, because if you're it. emulating synthesizers and you have only two synthesizers and you would like to uh, play six synthesizers, like sometimes we did, you have to have the backing, the backing yeah, tracks. Or else bring the people yeah. and hear them what? It's not possible. Because how can I bring six people to play four synthesizers and they give me 100, 100 pounds at the end 80. of the night? <laughs> what do I tell them, the, the, those who played with me? I give them five pounds or ten pounds? It, it happened to me that uh, yeah. when, so I played, the when I played Megapulse. That's the, real, the real reality of the whole thing, no? No, that uh, was another problem, obviously, that affected uh, the, the, the way things had to be done. I mean, the, finance, the, the payments weren't encouraging at all. Not, perhaps they're still not as encouraging. But we were not bad, um, like foreign bands. Uh, they have a contract. Uh, of and you have totally everything. Exactly. Exactly. And you have exactly. thousands and thousands of... Uh, uh, no of problem. You got signed to a company and then that's it. Financially, for extent, you made albums. I don't know how many. Three, four, was a Albums, ten. Ten albums. Was it financially rewarding? Financially? No. No. But the only financially the rewarding the only financially rewarding album we made is the Maltese one, the Christmas, the Christmas album. That's a very big seller to this day. Um, but the others, you only break even. I'm being, I'm being truthful, I'm being honest, we didn't make any money. But no. people used to buy the album. Yes. yes, by the album, but, uh, the, the, budget, the, but the, bu the budget, we, we, the budget we spent to make the album was recording was expensive, much the more than the, the than the money we, we, we got yeah. from selling the album. So we break even or even worse. That's the that's the whole truth from our part. Right. So um, switching back to my previous um, uh, question, I'm going to go to Simon actually with Art and Glass. Um, you had. I think a, a good number of performances. You, you took part in festivals uh -huh. that were held here. I'm not sure if you were in Denim and Leather as well. Were you in Denim yes, and Leather? Yes, I were in Denim and Leather. Uh, so what, was there a particular event where you felt, oh, this was the best performance we've had? Fulfilled. Um, when we got a sponsorship, actually, from Bank of Valletta. Mm -hmm. We played this, this venue, and there was a guy after we played, and he was smiling at me, and I thought to the, well, this is smiling at me because we already got comments because we were wearing makeup and long hair, you know. And he approached me and he said, hi, would you like to release a record? <laughs> I was flying inside. <laughs> of course, and they gave us a sponsorship and we made the recording and the pressing of the single and... Okay, so yeah. that was obviously... That a was really a big push, too. Uh, right. And um, I, I, now that you mentioned, like, uh, with, with, all the, with the image, which was important at the time as well, and that extent, I think you, you <laughs> ran away with it, actually, <laughs> as you could see from the pictures there. Um, you probably need a sponsor from a cosmetic company, I think. We had for her, eventually, from Leonard's you, you and my yes. and for makeup as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least they were, they were helping as well. Structure were on the other side, uh, not so big into the image, but I have to say, because I remember obviously going uh, very, very frequently to the rehearsal room in Tignes, 
Um, Mike Bukowski was an Imogen himself. Yes, yes. Mm. You, didn't, you didn't, didn't need That's anyone else, show. you know? Mm. When we had Michael Bukowski, he, like he sold the show. <laughs> he was a professional rock star. I mean, he had the looks, obviously, no one could... Uh, he was really nice person. And also, he had the... Uh, the vibe, the whatever yeah, he, you can call it. He, ha he uh, had it in him. You he had, he had the stage presence. He he played and he danced and uh, his playing was 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 quite uh, melodic and you know had everything. And he stole the show. In fact, he was the frontman more than. Yeah, uh, Tony was more active more, running yeah. around, but uh, I mean, no, of course, with so. the new wave, it was fashion. They mm -hmm. wore bright colored uh, jackets and hair going up like this. And I have pictures of that as well. I mean, it was in 1985 yeah. when we changed, you said, when we you changed the earlier. style. Yeah. We, had to, we had to go in there. No, no. Uh, you said earlier that, for example, you have to look back to the past to be able to go into yes. the future. Yes. And th that was the new romantic scene, which was the scene that actually sparked off all the makeup. Mm -hmm. And then it branched into the, the new discovery of the synth sounds and uh, bringing them to the masses, because as you said there, actually, there, uh, yes. there were there were 70s sounds that were electronic. Yes. Obviously, those were the pioneers. True. But what the 80s and the uh, New Romantic movement did was that brought that to the masses instead of to just the niche. And to do that, they actually packaged it not only with the sound, but with a look that they Fashion. stole from the f yeah. from the French stolen, romantics, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, and they, and they gave it their own twist, and it was their own way of rebelling. The punks rebelled in their own way, but the yes. New Romantics actually rebelled in their own way as well, because yes. Yes. bringing, this, bringing this, an instrument like the synthesizer into the music and taking over with such magnitude was a statement in itself. Yes, true. As uh, well. I agree 100%. Dif a difficult thing, eh? because we were part of Tenier. And of course, it was yeah. major uh, rock, rock bands. Rock, and rock, uh, to come scene. out in that style of music, it was very difficult for us to have makeup and things like that. It was, uh, even the music itself was already a, a problem there. Look, they looked uh, Yes, at of us. course. The music was already different to what so, was going on. To change our fashion as into the fashion as yes, well yes. was going to be... But you did. Pro but we did. Yeah, eventually they From did. From 1985 yes. onwards we did, if you mm -hmm. see the pictures. And, and I have to mention now that you mentioned Tinier, yeah, eventually also the, the mentality had uh, of perhaps mostly rock or metal bands, Tinier yeah, also brought together then, apart from structure, you had bands like Subverts, who were totally not metal, definitely not. Uh, you had Chai Tu. Chai had was before structure. In yes, fact, yes, also, but they fact, weren't metal. Yes, of course. And the but they were there as well. weren't. Uh, Shaktonics as well. And uh, those Rizam, were the pioneers. I think, as well. Those were the pioneers. As well. So, so it wasn't, because uh, Tenier we, wasn't really majorly metal. No. But, you know, I mean, uh, then but you have to consider still that, was rock, that bands right? like Arting Glass and Extend drummer, were outside of Tenier. So. Our drummer, who was also the founding member of Extend with Godwin, and later myself, um, he came from Tenier. From Tenier, from punk. Actually. Yes, from, from Upstras. used to be with Upstras. He was with Upstras. <laughs> so he was a punk. For that. He started we ended from up in punk and came. And, came and when he song. came, we it was him, Godwin, and me who decided on the image. So he came out of Tenier from a punk band, and we decided on the image of a, of a new wave band, new, new, new romantic band. So he, he designed the, the clothes, he designed it, uh, the Chris. clothes, yes, yes. the first set of clothes, oh, 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 those. Oh, oh. He, he designed them, he designed them. So he came, he came from Tenier, from a punk band. So. Yeah, sure, yes. definitely. By that time, the music scene was changing drastically. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Rock was I, on the decline. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, not I wouldn't say it's on the yeah, decline. Yeah, I think it, it kept going, but uh, it kept. what happened was they had the mainstream to was taken over. By, by, by the new wave yeah. and new romantic the, bands. The rock bands, it's they the had to time, incorporate the, the synthesizer, like Europe. Yes. Like Europe, for example. They had to incorporate... And, and that's what happened. Uh, At first there was uh, resistance, yeah. and then eventually they realized this is something we can exactly. use to our advantage as well, and then adapt to the times and exactly. just gain new audiences perhaps as well. And I think that also was reflected eventually in Malta. Because I know earlier you mentioned that, for example, there was a lot of uh, negative... Uh, attitude towards extend because everybody was saying, oh, they're playing playback, which was not the case. 
Uh, but I think eventually bands would start to realize that uh, just because you have a synth in the band or two or three doesn't mean that you don't know how to play or anything like that. So obviously that, that f finally um, was understood as well. I mean, it was it was a hard road for you guys. I know that for sure because I remember the, the scene at the time. It to was it, it was like a lot of aggro towards extent for some reason. But to make <laughs> it hundred percent clear, not from the audience. Eh? From no, the no, it was inside the scene itself. Inside yes, the scene, yes. because the audiences, the people. Oh, you had uh, you had a good people, following. Oh, and yeah. the people, uh, let us let let's make this clear. The people are watching a performance and they judge you on the performance. Yeah. They are not going into the details of how you performed or what you did to perform like that. They hear your product. If they like, like your product, you're in. Yeah. They are not going to say, uh, but he's using a sequencer, but he's using uh, a backing tape. But he's, it's not the real drums, no. it's an electronic <laughs> drum. Most people didn't it's, even know uh, that there were uh, sequences, uh, exactly. what the sequencer exactly. was. So, I mean, the, the audience is going to judge you on your performance, on how you perform. Yeah. That's that it. was always the case, really. I mean, um, uh, and unfortunately, it took them a while to understand that a band that has synthesizers is also worthy of that um, acceptance. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So I think that that was practically... Uh, the situation. I remember it very clearly. Obviously, I was at the same time as you guys. I remember you from way back. And again, one of, one of the reasons we, we definitely needed to have you guys here on board along with, with uh, Pierre and, and Simon as well is that I think looking back and I think I, I see Frank in the audience. Frank is from back in the same day. We, we all know if there was the, the top band at the time, I think it was Extend. That was it. I mean, the, in the, especially for the mainstream itself, which was like a crossover with synth, mu synth pop music as well at the time, it was extant. I think looking back, if you go to the media and all that, there's only a few articles that we posted here, but there was always a presence. And the thing is, uh, kudos to you guys, because you still are in the media with your other releases and uh, there's always a presence, even social media. Now you've actually gone there as well. Unfortunately, art and glass and structure aren't um, um, together anymore, uh, but we do, we do have at least some recordings and releases from, from the bands. I know, um, Simon, I'm going to this question as well. I'm, are you still musically active now? On my own, yes. You still at make home. music uh -huh, on yeah. your own? You ha I know you have an old, old school setup, a lot of synths, you're a yeah. synth uh, fanatic. To surround myself. Totally surrounded <laughs> by things. But you still make music, but you don't release. Yeah, no, no. And is that, that's a conscious decision that you, you don't want It makes me to. happy that it's still in, in me, you know? Just for you? Yeah. And you have no wish to share with? No, no. No, it's very strange. It's, very, it, it's a pity, really. Because um, uh, that would be nice. I play happen. very strange as well. I play a matter. strange kind of music. <laughs> Just for the record, before we came to, to start this session, Simon and I were having a chat and obviously we're discussing a bit, uh, some weird musical taste as well that we both share as well. So there's nothing wrong in that. No, I mean, I'm sure there's, a, there's people who will look for that as well. Pierre, I know you've done a couple more uh, projects yes, as well. Yes. I um, did uh, Megapulse in 1993. Um, no, with, uh, with Mark Tonner. We some, some material mm -hmm. in our studio. Yes. It was excellent. Yes. It was, you had the guitarist Cassatori Gianni. Cassatori Gianni yes, as well, time. yes. yes. <laughs> um, uh, then, obviously, a hiatus. Then, in 2000, I played again with David Cassatori Gianni with Scar. And I was responsible for the first single, Calling Out. Mm -hmm although I didn't have that much credit on it because uh, I was chucked out of the band because I was old, they said. <laughs> One of the members said I was old. It's a pity. Well, I won't delve into that. So but then you had another project. Scar, Scar uh, we played for, I played with them for two Pierre, years. Pierre, give me a second so I can lose my now. identity card, please. <laughs> <laughs> hide it, hide it. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I mean, that was another lovely experience, and uh, I loved that. Um, and they had and, the My Spirit and as well. And then My Free Spirit, that was my own compositions 
uh, as I wanted them, and I also sang in them. This so the you did everything, this was all yes, you? Yes, it's all okay. me. Lyrics, music, everything. I was helped by a producer that is no longer, unfortunately, with us, Cathy Manuel. Uh, she died of cancer this year, and that was a big, big setback to me because um, we were like friends. Although I, I recorded at her studios, I didn't really pay that much money into the recordings. I did give her something every now and then, but it wasn't like payment. And obviously, as everybody knows, payment for a recording of an album today it goes into a thousands of euros. So I must admit that even with Simon here, it's very difficult to produce an album by yourself, yeah. costing over 15,000 euros. And then you have oh to... Oh, no, I wasn't asking him to release a whole album, but at least to yeah. share some of the work. But if I, if I can interrupt you, like I was telling you outside, uh, just to make it clear, you're saying the truth, nothing but the truth. But part of the truth is that today, not like in the 80s, in the 80s, you know, we had to pay very good money to make recording yes. in pro professional studios. Today, if you have a v good laptop yes, yes, and a can. good program, something okay, which I'm not. You're in uh, here. Yeah. Yes. Don't discourage yourself. Yeah, you're in. I don't really like and that. If, if you don't, <laughs> and if you don't produce something that costs 15,000, it will cost you much, 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 much less. less. Yeah. Much less. And you're still <coughs> satisfied. I did, uh, I, 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 did two, I did two albums to as my free spirit. Um, unfortunately, the second album I was going to release exactly when my late mother got sick. And uh, so everything had to be stalled. And Obviously. since 2015, this album has never really gone out. But a song from this album um, is on Reverb Nation. It's a Maltese because this was a double album. Second one album was a double album. Albit for Belhefer, and I dedicated to my late dog as well, Shiro, who died of cancer as well in December of last year. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a lot of setbacks. Um, uh, in but the making. album is there. Yes, the album uh, is so there. But it has never been actually, actually released. Officially released. Officially released. Um, uh, it has a lot of 80s in it. Um, uh, because it, one of the albums is in Maltese and the other one is in English. The English one uh, has a lot of 80s feel to it. Um, hopefully someday I'll yes, be I will be uh, able I'm, I'm actually thinking yes. that while you're saying that. <laughs> because <laughs> that we'll, I need, we'll get I need to, talk to actually, about this. yes, I have an interview on a radio station and get some of the songs out played. there. Yes, yes. definitely. But um, so for the time being, that is the work you're going yes. to be focusing in release yes. this. Um, Actually, no, because I sidelined it for, uh, for, for the time being. Um, it's there, but um, I was actually doing a project for structure. <laughs> okay. Um, so revisiting? Yes, revisiting some songs from structure um, and also adding another few songs. We were always known as a band that played uh, themes of war against war, uh, more on peace and things like that. In fact, our first overture, which wasn't even sung, was three minutes to midnight. That was uh, relating to the doomsday clock, which at that time was, was three, three minutes to midnight. That's why it came out. That was my first song when we were just three, three people in the band. Before Michael Bukowski came in, before um, uh, George, before and Tony. before Paul Tony. But when they came in, we, we made it as a song. But at that time, it was ready by the time uh, Tony came in as a singer. So we, leave, we left it as, as it is. And it was the song that many, many people loved. When we used to start with the, with the, with the concert with it, everybody loved it. It was one of the nicest songs that I've ever done. Most of the songs, I did them anyway. Uh, Michael Bukowski was uh, more... Uh, I think he handled the gl guitar arrangements Yes, mostly. and also he did Structure of My Mind that, yeah. and some other songs of that style. So he that was, was quite he, he, he was more well. ear friendly. He was more popish than yeah, me at yeah. that time. But later on, when obviously Mike left, 
then I started producing that style of music as well, with problems for tomorrow and, you know, uh, blue my ashes and uh, telephone call and shout and all those songs that became very popular with the audience in 1985, 1986. Those were my compositions and... And uh, you're actually re redoing them now? And I'm doing, redoing some of them and putting them in a theme about war. Uh, so, we'll, so we'll be listening to some structured music, yes. hopefully in the near future. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. It will take okay. a little bit more time because right. um, I didn't finish the album with Cathy and she left us yes, obviously. Uh, you obviously. Know, in just a few months. Yes. was something terrible for me and it took me a long time to get back to the songs. But now I'm uh, back on, sort of soon I will back, be back on the track. Good. So we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch. Yes, because unfortunately, as whilst Extend and Art and Glass have something on record, we never managed to. So produce far, there's only footage on yes, YouTube. Yes, footage on YouTube, but so no record. No actual so we, record. We really need to make a CD or vinyl album mm. that will at least be part of the history I think, of. I think uh, it took up just 25 years to release their first album. So. So We're going to take 35 years and <laughs> over, but it so will but come. But, 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 it's but it's coming. But it's, but so it's mostly yeah, my project more definitely. than yeah. structure because there is no, no one from structure yeah. anymore. I mean, Claudio doesn't sing anymore. He has problems with his yes, voice. So and obviously, and you'll have to. And Georgina has her own life. Thing, yes, as well. uh, Michael has stopped. Uh, Michael Bukowski is not in not Malta. Not in Malta anymore. So um, it's obviously a bit of a problem yes. for all of that. I've tried to get some people yeah. in, involved, but everybody has his own yeah. life, and unfortunately. Right. So, on a final note, extend. I don't need to ask if you're still musically active, because we've been regularly in touch over the years with every release that you've uh, made. You've even had the opportunity to go quite far abroad to perform as well, Charles. Yeah, to Australia, as far as Australia. That's so how far we went. It's quite far. Not I money mean, wise, eh? <laughs> no, opportunity my wise. My opportunity my wise. But um, it's still ex it ex more fun. experience. It was, it was fun. fun. So and uh, in Australia, I was impressed that uh, after 30 years in, the, in this business, let's call it business, it's not that business for us, but <laughs> in the let's industry. Call it business, in the industry, uh, I was amazed to see 100 people behind the door before it opened. I turned to the guys and said, you know how long in Malta there were 100 people <laughs> behind, <laughs> behind the door. Behind the door. <laughs> <laughs> in Australia it happened, Frank. It did, it so did. I was amazed. <laughs> I was amazed. Let's say the Maltese in Australia are magnificent. Uh, if you have the opportunity, take it, because they really love their country. They really love what everything that is Maltese, but you have to make a, many of the songs have to be Maltese. And Maltese as well. Because they, they may they think of their country. So, so there's a nostalgic <laughs> element to it as nostalgic, well. Nostalgic, yes. But um, yes. Uh, switching to the here and now, I know at the moment, actually, thank you very much actually for coming because we're I know you should be in, uh -huh. the in the studio right now, but um, you're here. Yes, instead. we're celebrating 30 years after Zbihil Milit. It's going to be called Il Win Il Milit this time. It's another double album. And it's going coming out in December, next December. It's going to celebrate 30 years. From the other Zbihil album. From the, other, from the actual, from the CD from release, from I think. The CD release, Because yes. the actual Zbihil Milit it was, was 18. No, but, but the first one, yeah? Uh -huh, the first then one, the, yeah. Then the first one plus the second. Was in 91. Was in Easter 91. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean. Just for the record, there's also another yes. album. Thank you. It's there's an achievement. Eh? There's actually Thank also you. another album that uh, has a 30th anniversary from Extend as well, same year. Social Dancing. Social, yes. social, uh, social dancing, dancing, yes. As well. Yes. So, I mean, uh, as you can tell, uh, they're a pretty busy band. As you can tell, <laughs> we're very old. <laughs> <laughs> I was going in to fact, we're ancient. I was going to leave we're that ancient. out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, wanted to, I didn't want to mention that. For the simple reason that, uh, b since I remember all of these, that uh, would make me feel very old as well, Charles. Yeah. So uh, right. okay. Okay. No, but they've uh, amassed all their money in their tummies. <laughs> 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 That's why it's being 
cap. Right. <laughs> That's called an investment. <laughs> <laughs> right, but um, obviously uh, we'll be looking forward to the release this year then of, of the new album. Um, uh, we can end the, the talk and the, the interviews here. Thank you for everyone, uh, to everyone for, for being with us. Thanks to Simon, thank to you. Pierre, Eric, Godwin and Charles. I would like to thank you in the name of everybody. You're welcome. Because if in this world there are no people like you, these, thing, these things does not happen. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Michael, and everyone involved. Yes. Thank you very thank much. You. I'd, like to, I'd like to thank Electronic Music Malta, obviously, it, it for the opportunity. It is very important that such an event like this also gave an opportunity to um, document, document this, yes, of course. part of history. Yes, if it wasn't for you and the... This, Electronic this, Music this, Malta, this, uh, MTP Foundation, service, we're all working together on um, this. So. If it wasn't for this, this wouldn't even be documented. And probably within 20, 30 years' time, everything would be, would be lost. It won't even be known uh, when, when we are down under. Yeah. The, the music scene can still revisit those pioneers and... Uh, exactly. And, and this is the whole reason why we are doing these talks, actually. There will be more of them probably next year. Um, uh, we're focusing on the electronic music scene, obviously, um, and with regards to this particular project, but ideally it should uh, spread out to cover all the styles of music that have been present in the local scene. But for now, obviously, we're here at Circuits Festival 2021, and uh, our main focus is electronic music. Electronica is the project. You can uh, visit um, uh, mtp.com.mt to catch up with what's going on with Electronica as well. There's a lot to be inputted still because we've, we have a lot of work to be uh, documented, edited, and et cetera, et cetera, to be shared online. And, um, but I, again, I mean, uh, we appreciate every kind of input, not just from the artists, but also from people who follow the scene, who may have information to offer and share with us so that we keep um, uh, track of as much information as possible within the depo repository of, uh, that we, we have online at mtp.com.mt. So thanks once again, all of you, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.